Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harris and I am president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I am very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Kerry Kennedy, best-selling author, human rights activist, and president of the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights. Ms. Kennedy comes to the City Club podium, actually I understand for the second time, but roughly 56 years after her father gave his famous speech, the day after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. In that speech, her dad spoke of the, quote, mindless menace of violence in America, end quote. Ms. Kennedy has advanced her father's legacy in her life work opposing violence and furthering human rights. It is also clear that she has created her own legacy in her lifelong work. By way of brief biographical background, Ms. Kennedy was born in Boston, Massachusetts, the seventh of 11 children of Robert and Ethel Kennedy. She earned her undergraduate degree from Brown University and her law degree from Boston College Law School. She started her human rights work as an intern with Amnesty International. In 1986, she established RFK Partners for Human Rights with the goal of ensuring the protection of rights codified under the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Now that declaration was adopted by the UN General Assembly on December 10, 1948, in the aftermath of the atrocities of the Second World War. RFK Partners uncovers and publicizes abuses, including repression of free speech, which of course is something near and dear to all of us here at the City Club of Cleveland. It also advocates for Congress and administrations to emphasize human rights and foreign policy. It provides activists with resources to further their work and also creates programs to advance respect for human rights. In furtherance of her global commitment to defend human rights, Ms. Kennedy established the RFK Training Institute in Florence, Italy, which offers courses of study to leading human rights defenders across the world. Ms. Kennedy's work has included a focus on women's rights, exposing injustices and educating audiences on sexual slavery, domestic violence, workplace discrimination, sexual assault, abuse of prisoners, and other issues. She, had, she has carried her human rights work to over 60 nations and led hundreds of human rights delegations. Her written work includes bestseller, Being Catholic Now, Prominent Americans Talk About Change in the Church and the Quest for Meaning, and also Speak Truth to Power, Human Rights Defenders Who Are Changing Our World. She appears regularly on major television networks in the U.S. and across the world, and her commentaries and articles have been published in prominent publications in the U.S. and abroad. Her awards and extensive activities include high honors from the President of Poland for aiding the Solidarity Movement, recognition from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, for leadership in abolishing the death penalty and service as chair of the Amnesty International U.S. Leaders Council. There's a whole lot more there, so I encourage you to, to do some research on you and a whole lot of, on her and a, a whole lot of stuff pops up. It's pretty amazing. Our speaker's father has numerous famous quotes. I think I did some research. I saw 36 famous quotes from Robert Kennedy, so I had to pick one that I really liked. And the one that really touched on, on her daughter was the purpose of life is to contribute in some way to making things better. That's what she's been doing during her life, and I'm proud to present her here to the City Club of Cleveland. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, awfully, I'm awfully happy to be here in town. Thank you so much for making all this possible and to our sponsors. And I want to sp say a special thanks to Tim Hagen, who is, uh, he's been so much of our family for so long. He just is our family. Um, and uh, former Cuyahoga County Commissioner, as you all know, but um, really one of my best, 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 oldest, best friends. And um, that is a, uh, a sentiment shared by, by many, many family members. So thanks, Tim. Um, I am so happy to be here because I almost didn't make it this morning. Um, there is just, there's just so much traffic going from my house to LaGuardia Airport, and then there was no parking at all anywhere. And it reminded me of this friend of mine who was, um, who lost his job during the, the economic downturn, and he got a job offer 
in New York at, it was just at 57th and, and 5th. Do you guys, are you familiar with that part of Manhattan? You know how crowded it is, impossible to find parking. Anyway, so he was, he got up and he came into town and he was there at seven o'clock driving around trying to find parking, eight o'clock, no parking, 8.30, no parking, 8.45, he pulls over and he says, dear God, please help me find a parking space. If you do, I promise to go to church every Sunday for a whole year. Just at that moment, <laughs> miraculously, right underneath the building he had to go and a parking space opened up. So he reverses in, he's putting money in the meter and he turns around and he says, never mind God, I found one myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> So um, when I was when I was talking to to Tim about what what I was going to what I might discuss today, and he said that you're interested in refugees, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but also about um, how I became involved in in human rights. And uh, my earliest memories are when my father was the attorney general at the height of the civil rights movement, and as you've just heard, I have ten brothers and sisters. My parents really didn't separate their home life from their work life. So um, daddy was down in the Justice Department and my mother would pile six or seven of us kids into the back of her convertible with a couple of dogs, uh, one of whom was a Newfoundland, which is a large dog, and a, and a football and bring us down to, to see my dad and we would run around the Justice Department and then we always liked to pretend we were spies and go, in this secret tunnel underneath the Justice Department to the FBI building and watch the sharpshooters at practice. And um, now at the time, the head of the FBI was J. Edgar Hoover, who's a man not known for his love of children or his sense of humor. <laughs> and, and so uh, we used to go and, and, and invade his building. And this is the strange part of this story is that there was a suggestion box in the bottom of the FBI building. I think that's kind of weird, but anyway. <laughs> um, so one day my mother took out her telltale red pen and wrote a little suggestion and stuffed it right into that box. And then as she was gathering up all the kids and the, the dogs and the football and bringing us back to daddy's office, um, a very astute FBI agent went and picked that suggestion out of the box and brought it up to J. Edgar Hoover, who had it immediately sent to my father. So that when, <laughs> when, when we walked back into my father's office, he was reading the suggestion. And it read, get a new director. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this was a very <laughs> early lesson in the importance of speaking truth to power, which is what I think the Cleveland Club is here to do, right? So, um, so I thought that was appropriate. Uh, on another occasion, my father wrote me a letter, um, and I still have it, and it's, it's on the wall of my house uh, today. And it said, Dear Carrie, today was a historic day, not just because of your visit, but because um, two African Americans were able to uh, register at the University of Alabama over the objections of Governor um, George Wallace. It happened just a few moments ago, and I hope these events are long gone by the time you get your pretty little head to college. <laughs> Love and kisses, Daddy. Um, and in many ways, those events were long gone by the time I got to college in 1981. But um, in many ways, we still, even to this day, have a long way to go. Um, so then, between, between that letter and college, I had this fabulous, wonderful, warm, loving family and all the gifts anybody could ask for in life. And intermixed in those were times of horrible, horrible, horrible tragedy and difficulty. And of course, you know, um, my uncle was killed, assassinated, and then when I was eight, my father too died just six weeks after Martin Luther King died. Terrible tragedy for, for our family and for our nation and for our world. Um, 
And then I, I was in third grade then. When I was in fifth grade, one of my family's best friends who are at our house every weekend, you know, really, really close friends, the daughter came to me and said, my, my father is beating up my mother. And I just did not know what to do with that. I didn't know how to protect this woman who I loved. I didn't know if this was a secret. Am I supposed to share this with somebody? Am I not supposed to share it? How do I protect my friend? How do I see the father who I really loved and who was so tender and, and warm to me? And it just, it was an impossible thing to put together. And um, then when I was in high school, two of my best friends were raped by two men they had just met. Um, and then one of my very, very closest friends was one of the youngest, the, one of the first people to die of HIV AIDS in the United States. And he did that, he was gay, but he was still in the closet because he felt it wasn't safe to, to talk about his sexuality and who he was. And um, so all of these things were very chaotic in my life and very, very difficult for me to, to, to grapple with and to come to grips with. And um, then when I was a sophomore in college, I started working at Amnesty International. And I was a volunteer there. I was an in intern during the summer. And I learned about something called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And reading that document changed my life because I understood for the very first time that all the crazy, chaotic, tragic, horrible things that happened in my life had one thing in common. They were all violations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They're all human rights violations. And I learned something else. I learned that there is a whole world out there of incredibly smart, extraordinarily courageous, people who were risking imprisonment and torture and death every single day so they could stop those violations. And that I could learn to stop those violations from them. And that's what I've been doing for the last 30 something years. And um, I came to that, I was given an assignment that summer. And that summer the assignment was to document abuses committed by US immigration officials against refugees from El Salvador. Now this is at a time when immigration issues were absolutely not in the papers and certainly not about refugees. And so how did I do my research? Because there were no newspaper articles on the issue. I called lawyers. I called young lawyers all across this country who had graduated from law school, and instead of going to uh, big corporate firms or, um, or other types of law firms, had decided to take on the cases of the poorest people who were never, ever going to pay them and would probably be deported before they even finished the case. And um, they were incredibly brilliant and completely devoted. and. Uh, they were my heroes, so I wanted to be just like them. And I went to law school as a result of that. But I'll never forget my first case. Um, there was, it was a, a family from El Salvador, and you remember in the 1980s, we, there was a war in El Salvador. And the U.S. government was supporting the government of El Salvador, which was also uh, supporting and perpetrating the death squads. So there's a union labor, and he went out on strike, and he was disappeared, and his wife went to go and find him. And his wife was told that if she continued to look for him, that she would be uh, persecuted. And she was. She continued to look for her husband, the father of her two children. And one night, these guys followed her back to her house, and. Um, uh, raped and murdered her 14-year-old daughter, and um, she and her 7-year-old son were able to escape. 
and they escaped to the United States. And they came over the border in Harlingen, Texas. And as soon as they got over the border, they were picked up by immigration service, and they were put in the Harlingen Detention Center. And the Harlingen Detention Center was built on a swamp. It had no air conditioning. Um, it was boiling hot in the day. And uh, the food the, had green mold on it. Um, the conditions were horrible. The food was rancid. Um, some of it was rotten. They went into the mother, and they said, we want you to sign a voluntary departure form, which says, I know my rights, and I'm returning to my country of origin. And she would refuse to sign. And then they went to her son, her seven-year-old son, and said, you have to sign this form. And he only spoke Spanish. And to his credit, he said, I'm, I'm not signing that because I don't know what it means. And uh, two of his fingers were broken. And they went back to uh, a nurse, a volunteer nurse came in, diagnosed the fracture, called in a doctor before the doctor could get there. They brought the son back in. He signed the form. They brought the form to the mother. She signed it. And they were put on an airplane and sent back to El Salvador, back to the death squads, but not through some surreptitious route right into the airport. So um, this was a very unusual story because we were able to track down the woman in El Salvador and get the whole story of what had happened. But I, right then and there, said, I just cannot believe my country is treating the most destitute with such disdain, the people who should be our most loyal supporters, the people who, even under those circumstances, sought refuge in the United States because they love the idea of what this country stands for, for freedom and opportunity and, um, and education and health care and caring, caring, caring about people. That's what they were coming here for. And um, I said, I'm, I'm going to stop this. We got to stop this. And so I just want to stop here for a minute and pay tribute to the people in this room who are doing that today. All those people at the Catholic Charities, is that all of you guys right here? Is that you? No. How about it? Can it, would everybody who's working on refugees just stand up? Anybody who's working? I knew you guys were working with refugees, not with the Catholics. Yeah. I mean, really. There are no people more vulnerable and in need of those protections uh, than refugees. There are more refugees in the world today than any time in the last 20 years, and nearly half of them, 46%, our children. From Syria to Sudan to Somalia, we have a generation of people who are growing up without basic rights to citizenship and employment and a right to build a life. And the United Nations High Commission on Refugees is currently serving nearly 34 million people. Imagine that. That's a whole country's worth. 34 million people forced to leave their homes because they are persecuted for their race, creed, color, national origin, or political belief. The practice of granting asylum to people fleeing persecution in foreign lands is one of the earliest hallmarks of civilization. Reference to it have been found in texts written 3,500 years ago during the blossoming of the great empires in the Middle East, such as the Hittites, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and the ancient Egyptians. Over three millennia later, in the wake of World War II, one of the first programs of the United Nations was to protect refugees waiting to return home from the war. Global migration patterns have become increasingly complex in modern times, involving not just refugees, but also millions of economic migrants. But refugees and migrants, even if they often travel in the same way, are fundamentally different. And for that reason, are treated differently under modern international law. Migrants, especially economic migrants, choose to move. To, in order to improve the future prospects for themselves and for their families. But refugees have to move if they are to save their lives or preserve their freedom. They have no protection from their own state. 
Indeed, it is often their own government that is threatening to persecute them. If other countries do not let them in and do not help them once they are in, then they may be condemning them to death or to intolerable life in the shadows without sustenance and without rights. When I was walking in today, somebody asked me, so what do you, you talk about these issues, but what do you do as an organization? What does the RFK Center actually do with refugees? So um, I, want, I want to give you three examples of the type of work that we do. Some of the work we do is strategic litigation. So we will take a, a legal case on behalf of refugees in, in certain places. One example of that is in the Dominican Republic. How many people here have been to the Dominican Republic? OK, a scattering. Um, there's an ethnic cleansing campaign in the Dominican Republic perpetrated by the government there against um, Dominicans of Haitian descent. So in the 1920s, the government of Haiti and the government of the Dominican Republic had an agreement that sent, that brought Haitian sugarcane cutters over to the DR to, to um, work in the sugarcane fields. And m many of them were, you know, 14, 15, 16 year old boys, and they stayed. They spent their entire career cutting sugarcane, and they got married, and they had children. Now, in the Dominican Republic, they have a, um, in their uh, constitution, they have a, a sentence, which is like the US Constitution. Anybody born here is automatically a citizen. They have an addition that says, unless, you're, unless they're in transit. And that was meant to cover uh, the children of diplomats and of, um, of tourists who were, who were moving through. So a judge about three years ago said, diplomats, tourists, and the progeny of, of Haitian sugarcane cutters. So just like that, overnight, one-tenth of the population of the entire country was told, oh, you're no longer citizens. You're stateless people. And um, so without citizenship papers, they, have, they can't get health care, they can't go to a doctor, they can't go to school, and they can't have a job. And um, so we, the RFK Center, have brought a case on behalf of them. We actually stopped them from sending 80 people back to Haiti. Um, and we're now in, in the midst of a case in the inter-American system to stop that altogether. So that's one example. A second example of the type of work we do on, on refugee work is advocacy. So um, this is uh, an example of that is in Western Sahara. Who here has heard of Western Sahara? Oh my God, well, all the refugee people have heard of it, but no, like nobody else has heard of Western Sahara. And there's a reason for that because, um, because it is under control of Morocco and Morocco won't let any journalists into Western Sahara. So you never read about it because it's not in the papers. So anyway, um, Western Sahara was a country that was, uh, um, uh, that was under the control of Spain. And then about 40 years ago, Spain pulled out. And uh, Morocco moved in and claimed it. And so there, there ensued a war between the Moroccans and the Polisario Front, which was the, 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 the local Sahrawi peoples fighting you know, force. And that ensued for about 10 years. And then the United Nations came in and said, we will broker a peace agreement and we'll remove the landmines. We'll make sure there's no armies fighting each other. And we'll have a referendum so that the people in this country can decide within a year whether they want to be part of Morocco or they want to be an independent state or if they want an autonomous region. Um, so out the Polisario, you know, pulled out and the uh, United Nations went in and um, then the Moroccans disagreed year after year after year about the 
contours of that referendum. So it's now been 37 years. And the, uh, I think the oldest, or maybe second only to the Palestinians, but the, one of the oldest refugee camps is in Tindouf, Algeria. So have you ever seen uh, Lawrence of Arabia? Okay. So if you go to Tindouf, it looks exactly like Lawrence of Arabia. It is sand everywhere you look, as far as you can see, and there is nothing that is growing and green, nothing. And that's where these couple million people live. And they've been living there for 37 years, in tents, with not one morsel to eat unless it's brought, flown in by the United Nations. Not one drop of water to drink unless it's brought in by the United Nations. And this goes on and on and on and on and on. So one of the things we're doing on the advocacy front is trying to get that referendum done and uh, trying to get um, a, a human rights monitoring mechanism within the UN peacekeeping force. So that's kind of another issue, but we can talk about it if you want. So, and then there's a, a third, third piece of what we do with refugees. And this is kind of not just refugees, but also migrants. But I want to talk about it because I think this is an issue that is impacting Cleveland as well. Um, we have a human rights education program called Speak Truth to Power, and it goes from kindergarten through law school. And it, uh, it teaches students about human rights defenders who have made a, a difference in their countries. So it's people from Elie Wiesel and His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Tutu, and then grassroots human rights defenders most people haven't heard of, a former slave in, from Ghana, et cetera, or nun from Guatemala, et cetera. Um, and then we teach kids how to create change in their classroom, community, country, and globally on a wide range of social justice issues. So we got a call three years ago from the superintendent of Bukyris, um, Ohio, which is about 90 minutes from here. And Bukyris is a town that has about 12,000 people in it who 95% uh, of them self-identify as Caucasian. And they had a huge influx of Mexicans. And um, they had a lot of trouble in that town. They had an enormous spike in bullying in the schools. They had uh, um, huge problems in the criminal justice system, in the juvenile system specifically in the juvenile system. And um, there was an enormous amount of tension in the town. And so the superintendent called and said, Can, will you come and, and help work with our community and work with our schools to address these issues? And we've been doing that for the last three years. And um, so far, it's been very, very successful. Now, working with the teachers and the administrators and the police and the judges and the entire, you know, anybody who comes into contact with youth on, um, on uh, sort of understanding one another and um, creating change and, and youth empowerment. So let, let me just tell you a little bit about that specifically. So when I've been working now in human rights for whatever it is, a little bit of over 30 years, I've seen that there are three different types of human rights defenders. The first is the most typical, and those are people who come from an oppressed community and stand up against the oppressor. So that would be Martin Luther King in the South, or it would be Nelson Mandela in South Africa. And that's all, that covers almost everybody. Then there's a much smaller group of people who are defenders without borders. And that is somebody from Cleveland who goes and works in Rwanda. Okay, so it's, you know, sort of parachuting in. You don't really have a dog in the fight. And then you take a stand and you, you get involved. And that's, there's a good number of those. 
The most rare, which you almost never see in the adult world, are people who come from the oppressing community and who are willing to stand up to their friends and their, their family and their colleagues and say, what we're doing here is wrong and risk being ostracized because they're doing that. So that would be like a, a white Afrikaner, like Reverend Bayer's Nade in South Africa, somebody like that. Um, but that, when you think about it, is a lot of what we're asking our middle and high school, school kids to do. Because their friends and their colleagues are the ones who are, who are ostracizing others or ganging up or saying those people are different. And so when we say to our kids, you got to stand up, you know, don't participate in a dumb jo blonde joke or don't, don't, uh, don't go online and say nasty things about somebody, that's asking a lot of them. And you can't just do that. You got to give them the tools got to show them how and you got to make it safe for them to do that and that's true with intercultural understanding and that's true with just bullying and um, it's true with everything they go through in life what I believe we're doing here is we need to build that generation because what happens is when you're when you're a middle school or a high school student and you're making that decision, you can make it 10, 12 times a day. Do I go along or do I stand up? And each time you make that decision, you're like, you're, it's like you're exercising a muscle. And you're either exercising the go along muscle or you're exercising the stand up muscle. And each time you exercise that, one of those muscles is getting stronger. And it becomes the go-to muscle next time you see something like that. And it not only becomes the go-to muscle in middle school and high school, but it becomes the go-to muscle in college and then in the work world and then in the world in general. So what we really need to do here is create a next generation of people who are exercising the stand up for justice muscle. And that's what we're trying to do through Speak Truth to Power. That's what all of you guys are doing too. I mean, you look at you, I know you're shaking your heads. Yeah, that's what you're doing. You're showing people how to become involved in a, in a new country, how to stand up for themselves, and how to empower themselves. And, you know, when we started this, what I hoped is I thought we're going to have lots of people working on trafficking, lots of people working on women's rights, lots of new leaders against the death penalty and all these atrocities and terrible things that go on or global warming, et cetera. But what I found is it's much more revolutionary than that. We're not just changing policy, but we're changing the way people see themselves, the way these students see themselves when they look in the mirror. They're suddenly not seeing someone who's a victim or a bystander but somebody who stands up and who they're proud of. And then that kind of changes the way they walk through life in general, the way they see themselves when they're writing a history paper or analyzing a piece of literature or making the decision about whether or not they ought to go to school today. So it's kind of a revolutionary thing. Um, I think that, you know, when, when you reflect on the problems that we faced in our society from, this, from bullying, from global warming, refugees, it's, it's kind of can feel overwhelming. And um, I think that it's easier to retreat into our own contained and demanding lives, which are really demanding of family and, and friends and relationships and work and everything else we're involved in. But I think there are lessons to be learned from human rights defenders who have really changed our, our life. And, um, you know, when I started working at Amnesty in, back in 1981, beside my particular assignment, I learned about refuseniks in Russia and uh, mothers of the disappeared in El Salvador and solidarity activists in Poland. And the, 
the cause was compelling and the enemy was dangerous and powerful. But I found myself surrounded by Davids who with little more than the slingshots of their, their hope and nerve and sinew to support them were standing up against a world full of Goliaths. And when you look back on what's happened in the world since that time, 30 something years ago, it seems like the angels prevailed. So when I, so 1981, all of Latin America was under military, right wing military dictatorships. And today there's not one of them standing. All of Eastern Europe was under communist leadership and there's not a communist leader left standing. And South Africa was at the height of apartheid and South Africa has had, now had a series of freely elected governments elected by a majority of their people. And women's rights was not on the international agenda. In fact, it wasn't until 1995 when Hillary Clinton went to Beijing and declared women's rights are human rights, which is her most famous line because it was so revolutionary to say that women's rights are human rights in 1995. That women's rights was even on the international agenda. And today, um, CEDAW, which is the Women's Rights Convention, has been ratified by 185 countries. Not our own, but 185 others. <laughs> so all of these changes came about, not because governments wanted them to, in fact, governments tried to stop them. And not because militaries wanted them to, great armies tried to stop them. And not because huge multinational corporations wanted them to, in many cases, big multinational corporations wanted to stop them. Not always, but sometimes. But because people, they happened because people with few resources beyond their own determination fought for human rights. And individuals created change. They harnessed the dream of freedom and they made it come true. And their efforts created a ripple effect, encouraging others and building a tidal wave which swept down the mightiest walls of repression and resistance. And with that, I would like to end with these lines from a poem by Langston Hughes. And he said, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be, the land where everyone is free, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again, we, the people, must redeem our land, the mines, the rivers, the plants, the mountains, and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states, and make America, America again. Thank you very much. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday Forum featuring Kerry Kennedy, President of the RFK Center for Justice and Human Rights. We'll return to our speaker momentarily for our traditional City Club questions and answers. We'd ask you to start formulating your questions now and would respectfully request that you keep them short and to the point so we can get as many in as possible in our remaining time. We welcome all of you here and those joining us through our primary media partner, 90.3 WCPN, 104.9 WCLV and WVIZ PBS IdeaStream, or on one of the many other radio stations across the country that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC, and our live webcasts are supported by the University of Akron. A week from today, on March 28th, the City Club welcomes Dr. Ronald Berkman, president of Cleveland State University here, and for information on all of our forums to make a reservation or to order a CD or DVD of today's program, you can do all that by visiting our website, www.cityclub.org. Today, we are pleased to welcome guests at tables hosted by Baker and Hostetler, City Music Cleveland, International Services Center, and Refugee Response. Thank you all for your support. Our community partners for today's program are City Music Cleveland and Global Cleveland. Thank you, too, for your support. Today's program is a David Ralph Hertz Memorial Forum on Civil Liberties, 
made possible by a generous gift from the Hertz family and the David Myers and Charles Stewart Mott Foundations. Joining us today at the head table is Harlan Hertz. Will you please stand and be recognized? Thank you for your support. And we welcome, last but not least, students to today's program. Student participation is made possible from a generous gift from the Jeffrey David Epstein Memorial Fund. Joining us today are students from Mayfield High School. So will you please stand and be recognized? Thank you for your support, and remember, you can ask a question. Now we'd like to return to our speaker for our tr traditional City Club Q&A period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are City Club Program Manager, Carrie Miller. There's Carrie. And Administrative Assistant, Christian Pianca. First question, please. Thanks so much, Carrie, for speaking with us here at the City Club. Early in your speech, you spoke about um, the Border Patrol and human rights violations that were happening there decades ago. Uh, a program on WNYC out of New York, which you're probably familiar with, called On the Media, has been focusing on human rights violations that are happening with U.S. citizens at the northern border. and. Um, and civil rights violations that are happening at, at both borders and at airports. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what's happening there, why you think it might be happening, and what you think ought to be done about it. Okay, thank you. Um, I haven't seen that particular program, but I am familiar with uh, many of the human rights violations, especially along the Mexico border. I would highly recommend a um, documentary called The Fence, conveniently made by my sister, Rory Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's really a, a, uh, a, a sometimes humorous but um, in-depth view at U.S. policy along the Mexican border. This is, um, this is a, an extraordinary um, waste of funds and um, really uh, puts a terrible face on the United States, in my opinion. Um, we are spending literally billions and billions and billions of dollars to build a huge fence, uh, our own Berlin Wall, um, along the border between California, from California through Texas. There are huge gaps um, because the Rio Grande meanders through, because people's uh, ranches go on both sides of the border or they can't build the fence at the bottom of somebody's property line so they have to cut the person's property line in two. It makes no sense. Um, and there are, uh, the, the only real thing it does is send a, a terrible message to our neighbors and make um, border crossings more fatal than they already are. Um, this is born of the, this kind of um, racist rhetoric uh, and misunderstanding about why we have so many um, undocumented people in the United States right now. The, most people don't come over the border, come over that border in order to come to the United States. Um, the vast, vast majority of undocumented people in the United States come here legally and they overstay their visas. That's how uh, almost everybody does it. In addition, there has never been one example of a, uh, of a terrorist coming into the United States, I mean known, um, over the Mexican border. That's just not how people get here. So um, this is a, uh, a terrible way to send an awful message, and it's and a real misuse of our funds. So thanks. Uh, what initiatives, if any, does the center have with regard to comprehensive immigration reform? and? What advice do you have to me as someone that chairs a group called the Hispanic Roundtable to, to help get that achieved in America? 
Um, thank you very much. So the center doesn't specifically work on comprehensive immigration reform. That said, it touches on so many of the issues that we care so deeply about and um, that, uh, that particularly impact some of the constituents who we do work with on a day-to-day -day basis, specifically farm workers. So um, what should you do? Well, my brother, my brother Bobby has spoken here, and he is, um, he's an environmentalist, and he always says it's, um, uh, it's better to change your leader than your light bulb. So um, <laughs> change your leader. <laughs> I mean, you know, think about that. You, you got to get your constituency to go out and vote, and especially the Latino population needs to get registered and needs to vote and needs to vote on the issues that really concern it. So that's, I think that's, that's one piece of it. Um, the other thing is that, like I said earlier, we are, I mean, I think we're really blessed to be living here in the United States because this is a country that's born of revolution where it's possible to actually possible to change institutions through citizen activism. And um, so I don't know exactly what you're doing now, but, um, but through your activism and getting involved and getting more people involved, you can actually create change in our country. I think Ohio has a particularly strong capacity to do that because you're so darn important in the presidential races. And so people pay more attention to this state than they do to other states, and they particularly pay more attention to Cleveland than they do to other parts of Ohio. So I think that, you know, um, you are probably in a much more powerful position than, than than many of your constituents might might understand. Um, I would uh, I'd spend some time in Washington and I'd go talk to John Kasich. Um, and uh, let's see, what else would I do? <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I think that's a good start. Um, let me just take a moment to talk about our one of the groups of people we work with are farm workers. And um, farm workers, uh, because of leftover Jim Crow laws, and I'll just talk about New York. I don't know exactly what it's like here in Ohio. But in New York, we're 37 years behind California for farm workers. So farm workers in New York have no right to a day off per week, have no right to overtime pay, have no right to, have little rights to workers' comp. and. Um, uh, can be fired if they try to collective bargain or uh, form a union. And so I went and met one farm worker in New York who worked, I asked him what his hours were, they midnight till 4 a.m., 8, 8 a.m. till 12 noon, 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., and he started again at midnight. Okay, so 12 hours a day, those were his working hours. I said, when do you get a day off? He said, no, we don't get a day off. I said, well, after a week, do you get Sundays off? No. After 32 days, how long it takes to fatten up a duck for foie gras? Incidentally, Hudson Valley foie gras. If you go to any fancy restaurant here in Cleveland and ask for foie gras, it comes from Hudson Valley foie gras where this guy worked. So just, just to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just sharing information here. He, um, he said, no, not after 32 days. How about Christmas? They give you Christmas off? He said, no, because we got ducks got to eat on Christmas. I said, when, well, so when do you get a day off? He said, I worked here for 10 years without a day off. 10 years without a day off, okay? He worked there for 18 years. His, I said, did they give you anything? Did they give you health care? No. Did they give you housing? Oh, yeah, they give us housing. What's the housing like? 10 by 14 foot room with two married couples and three single men sleeping in shifts, okay? Completely legal in the state of New York. Why? Because of just leftover Jim Crow laws. Because when President Roosevelt was passing the fair labor legislation in the 1930s under which every deli worker in Cleveland works, and everybody in this room works under those laws, um, the 
the, the, the white Southern Dixiecrat racist senators didn't want blacks to have the same rights as whites. So they said, we'll only pass this legislation if it doesn't apply to the two places where blacks could get jobs in large numbers in the 1930s, domestic help and farm workers. So to this day, there are no protections for domestic help and farm workers under the, the federal fair labor le legislation. And so Cesar Chavez made all that progress in California 37 years ago, but that didn't impact New York. So we still have these horrible, horrible laws in the state of New York. You might want to look into what happens to farm workers here in Ohio. Thank you. I uh, was wondering if you could share your thoughts. Do you think that there is a real a chance of true immigration reform with the government that we have now, the federal government, that seems to be at an impasse as far as legislation. Right. Um, I, uh, no, I don't. I mean, with this Congress, no way. I don't, I, I don't think, I mean, they're perfectly clear about it that they're not going to do it. So I, I don't think you're, but this guy over here <laughs> is going to go talk to John Kasich. <laughs> going to do it again. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think it's really hard. I think it's really, really hard with the Tea Party and with the, all the Koch brother money uh, pouring into these races. And, you know, um, I think that that's why we really have to get organized. And um, we can't leave this up to other people. We got to get registered to vote. We got to get our people out. We have to get involved in the political process. And uh, no one knows that better than Tim Hagen, so you can come and ask him what, what to do. <laughs> Thanks. It is impressive, even in this room, and given your presence on the, on the platform, to see the importance of women's participation in refugee work. Mm -hmm. And I am somebody who believes very strongly that educating women is the key to much progress in developing countries, and <laughs> ours too. Uh, but with that in mind, I would like to ask you about how your mother affected your life. Oh, that's so nice. Thanks. Well, I told you that story about my mother with, the <laughs> with uh, J. Edgar Hoover. Um, you know, my mother is a really, really remarkable woman because she uh, she grew up in a conservative Republican um, uh, household, and then she married my father, and um, and she went through a, a big transition, and um, she was incredibly uh, lighthearted and sort of uh, gay, cheerful, fabulously fun. Um, woman and uh, and she had 11 children and she and then my father died when she was pregnant can you imagine 10 kids and pregnant with the 11th when my father died and she raised us you know I was a Kathleen my oldest sister was 16 she had all those kids and um, she was like as tough as they come she knew what she had to do and she did it and we had, uh, we had breakfast together every morning. We had lunch at 1 o'clock, and you better not be late. And we had dinner at 7 o'clock every night. Um, you went in, showed her your fingers. They're not, those fingernails aren't clean. You get up and leave the table. Go wash your fingernails. Clean shirt. Say prayers before dinner. Say prayers after dinner. Um, and... Uh, and then we read the Bible after dinner, and we um, went to her room and, and said the rosary every night. Um, we all went to church every Sunday and during the summer, three days a week, at least. I mean, she was tough. And, you know, I mean, it, it's, she was like, she did what she had to do. You have all those kids, and there was always, she never once, I never once heard her say no when somebody said, can I invite a friend over? There was always a gazillion people at our house. And um, 
and many, 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 many people feel like they're poor, more part of our family than they are part of their family. I mean, imagine that, being that big, big enough heart to bring all those people in. Um, and uh, she taught us every sport. She taught us all how to play football, how to ski, how to play tennis, um, uh, how to sail, et cetera. She's the toughest competitor I've ever met. She definitely, she, she will beat you. Um, <laughs> should I tell you a little funny story? How much time do we have? We have a couple, a minute, one minute. Okay, I'll tell you this quick story about my mother. So, um, so we, I went to her house last summer and um, she hadn't seen my three kids, her grandchildren, for, um, for you know, six months and then she hadn't seen three other sets of grandchildren. So there are nine children there, grandchildren. She says, let's play Bananagrams, which is a great game, I recommend it. And uh, so she pulls out the Bananagrams, we're all playing, and my daughter yells, Bananagrams, she, she won. And my mother says, isn't that great, darling? And she gets up out of her chair and she comes over and she says, oh, you, you did table very good and cup very good and oh, you misspelled crouton. So we'll have to keep playing. Okay. <laughs> And somebody else says, Bananagrams, oh, very good, well, you, you, you spelled spoon, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm coming. Anyway, <laughs> she managed to eliminate all nine kids until she <laughs> <laughs> And there's not one grandchild who has ever won any game <laughs> of tennis or football or skiing or anything from my 85-year-old mother, so she's... Uh, <laughs> That may be one of the best City Club endings of all time. So, Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a Friday forum featuring Kerry Kennedy, president of the RFK Center for Justice and Human Rights. Thank you very much, Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.